This is a J Mix exclusive. I got gotcha. you. All right, I'll go ahead and jump into it, man. Um, you have a new book out, uh, From the Streets to the Industry, My Life in Art and Death Row Records. What was your motivation to write this book, and how has the reception been so far? Uh, I've been getting good reception from everybody that's purchased the first run of the book. I just switched publishers, so I started my own publishing company. But so far, I've been getting good reviews. The reason why I decided to put a book out was Right now, you know, just trying to cross over, you know, from everything that I was doing back in the day, it's like historical art, and nobody really ever got the opportunity to see who I was or what I had going on. Like I like to tell a lot of artists these days, you know, a lot of people, they have social media to promote who they were, but back then in that day, we didn't have social media. We didn't have like an Instagram or Facebook or Twitter or nothing of that sort, so just me basically getting out here and trying to tell everybody who I was was kind of, it was, it was kind of, it was kind of crazy for me to just keep on doing that. So what I, what I wanted to do was I wanted to reintroduce myself and by reintroducing myself was basically writing this book, showing people all of the artwork that I've done. Cause plenty of people will already know who, who know the artwork when they see it, they just don't know who the guy is behind it. And then I just wanted to basically bring, you know, my, my story from Death Row Records to Light. And I kind of just wanted to let everybody know, you know, when people hear Death Row, the first thing that they want to do, they want to think negative about the situation. But I kind of wanted to let everybody know it wasn't an all negative experience. There were some good experiences involved in being at Death Row as well. And I wanted to kind of bring that to the light, too. Now, you've made yourself a celebrity with your artwork. Uh, do you consider yourself to be naturally talented, or was this something that you had to work at? I mean, if you read my book, you'll see it was it was something that I had to work at. You know, I was influenced by my aunt. I used to sit on her lap every day and look at her draw, and I wanted to be an artist, you know, to kind of model myself after my aunt because my aunt was real gifted at it, and I didn't really know how to draw. So I started, like, tracing out a coloring books and things of that sort, and eventually, like I wrote in my book, I ended up running into a, a little problem that kind of embarrassed me to the point to where, you know, I wanted to teach myself how to draw. So I was self-taught on everything. And it's just, I don't know, I just, I just, I learned. And I, I never really even received any, any schooling or anything other than high school and then learning, learning different techniques from the streets. Do you have any advice out there for people that want to go into the art profession because you're so acclaimed do you have any uh, advice that you would give people that are looking to get into that avenue the advice i would give is always copyright your stuff don't let anybody copyright your stuff for you always 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 make sure that you're taken care of financially always put your uh your best effort forth and stay stay grounded to what you want to do. And don't let anybody ever don't let anybody take you off of that course. Whatever you have made up in your mind, what you want to do with your talent, go for it. Don't let anybody change your thoughts. Now you, you speak of uh, learning to draw um, and from your aunt and tracing coloring books and 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 comics and and stuff like that. At, at, when was the transition? What was the turning point to where you thought that hey, I could do this for a living? You know what? It was high school. High school after I learned how to airbrush. Uh, every football game, everybody would come to me and they would want me to airbrush them something to wear to the football games on Friday nights. And that's when I started figuring, like, yo, I can really make money doing this. And I don't have to, you know, depend on anybody else giving me anything because it was like my mom and dad, they were, they were giving me lunch money to go to school with. But after a while, I was just telling them, like, yo, I didn't need it because I was getting – so many different people that were coming at me wanted me to do art projects, uh, airbrushing. I mean, to be honest, like in art class, people used to pay me to do their assignments for them. So I knew that I can, this could be like a, a very good thing for me to grow up and, uh, and make and, and take care of myself off of. Because you were doing some of their art, for them, was there ever uh, an experience where you did someone's work for them and then 
they, you know, got a good grade or won a prize for it? Uh, you know what? I think that I think I did in a high school contest. I had helped so many people, and it was crazy because I came in second place to something that I helped somebody with, and they won first place. So that was kind of ironic to me. <laughs> It made me not want to do nothing else for nobody else. <laughs> now, in in your career, did you have any roadblocks? Did you have anybody ever telling you that you couldn't make it or that your art wasn't any good? Did you have any haters? No, I never had any haters. Everybody that I ran into, you know, during my career, they always encouraged me to stride forward. You know what I mean? I've never had anybody come to me and say, yo, you're not going to be able to make it. You're not good as this person. You're not that great. I've never had anybody do that. All of my friends, they've always backed me up and always encouraged me to take my art, you know, one step forward than what I was already taking. So no, no, never no haters. Is it true that you linked up with Death Row while working at the SWAT team? Well, actually, that's true. But in a sense, I was, I was, I was still Actually, my friend Clifford, he was he had a shop in the swap meet. We were working in the swap meet, but at that time, we had just moved into a store, which was right across the street because he was actually tired of working for the swap meet because he couldn't do things like how he wanted to, and he couldn't stay as late as he wanted because at the swap meet, you only had certain hours you could be there. So what he wanted to do was open up his own store so that way he could stay in as late as he wanted to. So at that time, when I got introduced to, to Suge and at Death Row Records, I was working with him at his store. So that was right across the street from the Compton Swap Me. But all of my life, you know, airbrushing, you know, just starting off like commercially, I was in the Compton Swap. Can you tell the fans out there about the day that you met Suge Knight and Tupac? And were you a prior fan of his? Yeah, I, I've been always a fan of Tupac. So, I mean, from the Juice days, I mean, and I kept up a real close eye on him when he went to prison for the first time. I mean, Me Against Me Against the World was one of my favorite albums. So it was very, it was, it was very real. It was, it was just super real for me to be able to meet him, which should introduce me to Tupac the day that they were shooting uh, the California Love version, at the, the California Love video version at the Compton Swap Meet. I happened to meet Shug that day. He introduced me to Pop. Pop wanted me to work on, um, something for uh, America's Most Wanted. But that didn't happen. I ended up doing the insert, working with Hand Dog, you know, before he passed, working on the insert for the All Eyes on Me album. So that's how that's what kicked off my career. We're working for Death Row. Had you met Suge prior to this? Had you, had you seen him around the neighborhood? Yeah, I saw him around the neighborhood on a few different occasions, but he had never got the opportunity to see my work. He only knew that I knew how to paint. But he had never saw any of my artwork. Because at that time, I was rapping. So when I introduced myself to Shug, I introduced myself as a rapper. I didn't even introduce myself as an artist. But my cousin Gina, she ended up showing Shug some of my artwork. And at that time, he wanted to, he really wanted to sit down with me and meet me. But at that, that time, when I went to meet him, he was having another meeting with MC Hammer and Tupac. So I wasn't able to sit down and talk with him that day. But he was able to see my work. You brought up uh, that you said that Pac wanted you to work on two of America's most wanted some art for it. Did you ever get it? Did you draft anything for that? No, actually, I didn't. He had just talked to me about it, so I wasn't sure. I was just waiting on a phone call to see what I was gonna do. He he looked at my portfolio. He liked my work, so that's what he he said he wanted me to work on. That was gonna be the first project, but it didn't happen that way. When I got the phone call to actually work on something, it was for the insert of the album. So I, I really didn't complain. You know, I just had, I just knew that I had a big opportunity ahead of me. Now, uh, the insert of that album is a pretty famous insert. What, what was your inspiration for that? Was that what you saw at the video shoot, or was it just something that came off the top of your head? Actually, I worked with Hand Dog on that project. Hen Dog brought a couple of sketches through of an idea he had. I looked at the sketches. I started putting together, you know, a drawing off of his sketches, and, we, and I started painting it. We were working on that project for maybe about three days. I talk about all of this in my book, 
We worked on a project for about three days. We finally got it done. When we got it done, he took me up to the death row offices to present it. And at that time, I wasn't even hired. I was just being hired. I was just working as a freelance artist. What was uh, Pac's track? Did you get the show to Pac? You know what? I didn't get the show directly to Pac. What I did was I walked it into death row interscope. At that time, we shared the same building at 10900 Murdoch Plaza in Westwood. So when I walked it in, we walked it in over to Angel. I forgot Angel's last name, but she was actually the marketing, marketing person over Interscope. So we walked over to her and presented it to her, and she took it from there. But maybe, a, what, a few, because I turned that in, I believe it was December. It was December of 95 when I did the All Eyes on Me insert. We turned it into Angel, and after that, I didn't see Tupac until actually I got hired in February, and once I saw him and he and, and, and he found out that that was me that had painted it and he saw me, he just started giving me merch to prop stand. I don't, I don't want to give too much away because I do want people to buy your book, but... Yeah, that's why I'm trying to be so how I am about it because I want to leave something for, you know, something interesting for them to read because basically all the questions you're asking me are in there. <laughs> <laughs> no, no doubt. Um... From the from the time of the swap meet the meeting Shug, um, what was the process that landed you, um, in basically in the art department at Death Row? Were there subsequent meetings? Uh, I want to preface this. I've heard people say that Shug Knight had a weird way of hiring people, and I was just curious. Um, some people have just said that he would call them in the office when they already had the job, and then announce it to everybody without telling them. So, I guess my original question. Was there a process that landed you actually working for them? Were there subsequent meetings? You know what? Actually, it was kind of a process because once I met them the first time, it, it, it didn't go so easy for my first meeting when he introduced me to Tupac. I ended up being reintroduced to Suge by a lot of people that I knew from the neighborhood that kept bringing me back up to him, which made him actually take a look at me deeper because it wasn't like he was hiring an outsider, somebody that he didn't know. So by everybody talking to me, and, he, and it was people that I knew that he knew, I guess he felt comfortable enough to hire me. So he gave me a job. The first day of work, I showed up for the first day of work. I had a meeting scheduled with him. He didn't show up for late. Next thing I know, MC Hammer was coming up asking, well, who, who was risky? Where am I at? And then when I told him who I was, he told me Shug would be up in a couple of minutes to meet him. I met with Shug from there. He told me I was going to make a lot of money. Next thing I know, I was being hired on Death Row Records, and I was given a fat check for working on the album. Uh, some people have said that they were either not paid properly or mistreated while at Death Row. Were you treated well working at the label? I feel like I was treated well. I was given a lot of bonuses. I never wanted for anything. If I wanted something, all I had to do was put in a um, put in a pay a, a payment slip. I could put a payment slip in. Actually, a petty cash slip. I could put in a petty cash slip, fill them what I needed, and I was basically getting that like like clockwork. I never had any problems like getting any funds or having a problem getting my check from death row. Never, never that. Now, you've said before in previous interviews, and I've seen some of your artwork, um, that you're a fan of the Notorious B.I.G. Yeah, I was all, I was always a fan, even before I got on the Death Row Records. But when I got on the Death Row Records, that wasn't a conversation piece of mine. So that's something you just kept to yourself? You didn't catch any flack for that? I mean, I didn't catch any flack for that, but I mean, I'm not going to go to work bumping bitchy in the office. That, that I wasn't going to do. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, did you create any art for projects or albums that were scrapped or did not pan out? Uh, I did projects for Rage's album, Necessary Roughness, that didn't come out. I did two gangsters for radio artwork that didn't come out. I did a lot of stuff for Nate Dogg that didn't have the opportunity. So... That's just the name of a few albums, but I mean, I've done all types of artwork around Death Row Records. And I'm assuming that you go on that topic at length in your book? I'm sorry, repeat that for me? I'm assuming that you go in length on that topic in your book. 
Yeah, actually, my book is filled with unreleased artwork, stories, talking about the artwork. I mean, my, my book isn't just a book. It's actually a piece of art. You know what I mean? It has every page is artistic. It took a while for me to design this book and put this book together, actually, how I wanted it to be. And it goes from, it's like a timeline to everything that I went through at death row. I mean, from the from the first start, from the first start, start of me walking in, the first day of my first day of me being employed there, through all of my projects, every album cover that I've, I've done there. So it's not just your average book. I mean, if anybody wants to collect death row memorabilia, I mean, my book is definitely that. I, and I'm not trying to like toot my own horn, but I mean, it is. It, definitely that it has everything in there i tell you everything everything in that book is from my perspective as an artist at that world working there every day so it is what it is no doubt you had uh, brought up hen dog um not a lot is known about him uh could you tell the fans out there about your friendship and your partnership at death row and what he was like <laughs> as a person I mean, Hen Dog was one of the coolest people you would ever know. I mean, he used to pick me up for work every single day. I mean, we would we would drive. He would drive from his house in Bellflower all the way to my house to pick me up, and we would drive on all the way to to West L.A. I mean, Sebo was one of his favorite artists, so we would be listening to Sebo like almost every day. I mean, that time with him, I mean, that was just a, a really cool experience. I mean, because he basically opened the door for me and pushed me through. He never was like, you know, even though he was an artist too, he never tried to hold me back or confine me to anything because he was afraid I was gonna take I was gonna take the spotlight from him. He always pushed me through and encouraged me also to go ahead and do what I do because he knew that there were things art wise that he couldn't do that I could get done. And he never like I said, he never tried to hold me back. He always pushed me. So, I mean, to this day, I mean, I miss him, dog. I mean, our birthdays are on the exact same day, which is August the 16th. I mean, we were, we spent almost every day together. I remember sometimes when we moved to 8200 Wilshire Boulevard, we would catch the elevator all the way to the top of the penthouse, and we would be out on the roof next to the billboard just smoking, smoking blunts, just looking at traffic, just, Looking at the world, I mean, I just experienced so much with him, and I just hate that, you know, he's not here today. I know that you currently have a friendly relationship of uh, fellow artist Joe Cool, since we're on the topic of artists at Death Row. Was there any friction between you two at the time that you came to Death Row? Any competition, or was he even around at that time? Um, for those that don't know, that Joe Cool is the artist that did Snoop Dogg's Doggy Style cover. I mean, Joe Cool wasn't, he was around, but then he wasn't around. He wasn't the type of artist like King Dog and I were, where we reported to work every day and we were in the office every day. That, that just wasn't Joe Cool's style. You know what I mean? Joe Cool worked directly with Snoop, which is his cousin. He did a lot of work with the Dog Town, and I mean, he was a part of their posse, so it, it wasn't for him to be there every day. He was he was busy with his cousin and he did he did other things besides artwork for Snoop. So he was never there. I mean, there was a little friction when 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 we worked on the Dogfighter album, you know, with uh with me doing some of the artwork and you know, it was kind of a mixed up story. He thought he felt like I was trying to take credit for it, which I wasn't because I was giving him his credit, but it just didn't pan out that way. It was basically he got paid. I, well, no, he didn't get paid. I got paid for it, and he didn't get paid for it, and that's where the confusion had came in at. But, I mean, since then, me and Joe Cool have talked about that. That's strong in the past. I mean, he calls us the art nurse in crime, and, I mean, that's my boy. I call him whenever I need to talk about anything. I always call Joe Cool. We just... We just have a real serious friendship, you know what I mean? Because we feel like not just we, I feel like there is not another artist and Zen Dog is not here that I can go sit down with that has the same accomplishments as me, like historic platinum album covers like that. We're the only two. So I look, I look up to him, he looks up to me. You know, we motivate each other. So, I mean, that's that's my friend for life. It's like, I can't, I can't describe it any other way than that. 
Now, Death Row Records itself, it, it gets a bad rap. Is Suge Knight the big bad wolf that people make him out to be? I mean, speaking on my perspective, I mean, he was a good guy to me. I can't speak on how he treated everybody else or, or comment on everybody else's stories of him. You know, mine, I don't have, I don't, I don't have any bad stories to talk about Suge during the death row days. I mean, he always made sure I was straight. Whenever he visited the office, he always came and checked on me firsthand. He never, he never, I've never been threatened. I've never been hit. I've never been told to do this. Thing. I've never been told to do that. It was always, however, he, he told me to come up with the project. However, I came up with it. He was fine with that. It was, I just never, I just never had a problem with that. He was one of, he was, he was one of the coolest people up there to me. Like I didn't have no, I didn't have no worries. Now, because the the record label was so notorious, you know, a lot of people have come out and written books and told stories, and there's been many documentaries. As someone that was on the inside, have you ever heard a story about Death Row where you thought that's bullshit? I mean. Like I said, I can't really speak, you know, from everybody own from everybody's own memories of death row or what they went through and it's a lot of stuff that I didn't get to see on my own. So I can't really say like you know, their story was bullshit. You know, I can't I can't really say that because everybody has their own stories. But, you know, just looking at a few movies more more than just just recently the Michelle movie, just looking at that, I can't speak on what she went through with Trey. But the death row situation like so far as like I don't know. I can't I like I said, I can't really say, but when I looked at it I was kinda of mesmerized because I remember her being there being in charge at some point before I left and it didn't seem, you know, like she was really having that str- type of struggle with everything. Well, to be fair to you, I mean, there there is scenes where Suge Knight is watching about the shooting on television when he's sitting next to her. So, you know, a lot of people have found some inconsistencies in that story. Yeah, but I, like I said, I can't really speak too much for her story because I wasn't there for every 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 page of that. I, I only got to see her when she came to the office. I got to see certain things that she did. And actually, I was at one visit to the jail with between her and Shug. And, I, and just for that visit to the jail, she didn't seem unhappy to me. I know that there was times where she would do things around the office that people people liked. But I know that some people didn't like her. You know, they weren't feeling her coming through trying to be the boss. So, I mean, so far as like the movie, I can't really say, like, oh, this is bullshit or not. Because I really don't know how exactly everything played out with her behind the scenes or doing things that I was around. I would be a hypocrite to say, yeah, that's bullshit. And I don't know the full story, but just to say some of the instances that I feel like I saw, I do feel like they kind of just, they played out different in the movie than they played out in real life. Fair enough. Most notably, you are known for the infamous cover of Machiavelli. Was there already a concept in place, or did you have free reign to create your own design? I didn't. I didn't. I didn't come up with the concept for that idea. Tupac came up with the concept for that idea, and I just visually put it together. Everything that took place on the Machiavelli album was all Tupac's idea, so I just I just followed that. Did you ever? Did he ever say, you know, what what the meaning behind being on the cross was, or did you not ask? I mean, he explained that to me, but it was so long ago that I can't really re- re- rephrase it word from word on how he told me what everything meant. But I know that he said he felt like he had been crucified by certain cities and certain places and certain things, so he wanted to make that all come out visually in that album cover. I do have to ask, and forgive me if you don't know but what was that to be an official release do you know if that was supposed to be a release uh, like a a studio album or a lot of people have said that it was like a mixtape slash swap meet release do you know anything yeah, I, I, I wrote about it in my book <laughs> 
It is not. It was not intended to be a commercial release. No. And I'll go ahead, and I absolutely will direct everybody to go get this book. There's been internet pictures of an unreleased back cover that depicts Dre and Puffy and the Notorious B.I.G. in a certain way. Is that real? Yeah, it's definitely real. And I would have never talked about that. You know, I that 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 was hidden for almost. Let me see. That that happened in ninety six. I believe that happened in ninety. Yeah, it definitely did happen in ninety six. And it didn't come out till maybe about two thousand and nine, where people actually got the chance to see that. And that was due to the, the auctions that were taking place, where people were auctioning off material from Death Row Records, and it was actually found out, and people started talking about it. And once the people started talking about it, I guess they realized that my signature was on it. So they started asking me questions about it. And it's like I couldn't deny nothing that was actually there. It was true. So I started talking about it. Other than that, I've always, for years, I've always kept that picture under wraps. I've never spoken of it. And I've never really even showed anybody that picture. But that picture is also part of my book. Not for the disrespect, but for the history. Whose idea was it? That was all Pac's idea. As a fan of the Notorious B.I.G., did you have any ha apprehension making it? I mean, I did, but I just couldn't be like, yo, I'm a Biggie fan. Like, no, I can't do this. Like, I had to do what I was paid to do, so that, that's what I did. Now, I'd heard a story that uh, you were blessed enough to see Pac rap some of his Machiavelli-era songs in, during an interview before they were out. Can you tell us a little bit about that situation and your reaction? Uh, you know what I used to I used to I used to be around George Price a lot. George Price would take me to the studio with him a lot. You know, a lot of times I would be at death row, my work would be done. I'd have projects that were already ready, you know, months ahead of time. So he would take me with him because a lot of artists used to pick on him. So he used to take me with him because he felt like if I was with him, they'd kind of like leave him alone. So he had took me to an interview that he had set up for Snoop for the Dogfather album. And we went, it was actually for Deep, for BRE magazine. So we went over to Can-Am and we were, he was conducting the interview with Snoop and Pac came in. And when Pac came in, he started talking about the new Machiavelli album. So at that time, he started talking about it. He started playing a couple of cuts from that album, and he started, you know, reciting the raps and performing, like, right there in front of us. A lot of the songs that I heard, they end up not being on the album, so it kind of made me wonder, like, what happened to that song? Because a lot of stuff that he was spitting, I mean, it was, you know, Tupac was incredible, you know, with his word and his lyrics, his albums, his music, everything was dope. So it always made me wonder what happened to those songs. So, and that what comes with the fact that it was supposed to be an underground album and not a commercial release. Now, tragically, the last time you spoke to Pac was uh, on September 6th. How did that day start out for you? And can you share the memories of that conversation? I mean, the day started out cool. I was in the office. I had just gotten you know, the proofs back from the Machiavelli album artwork, which is the front and the back cover. I got a call from Roy Tesfai. Roy, you know, he was Shug's personal assistant. He worked in the front office. He told me to take the album art down to Tupac, which Tupac had in a, he had a penthouse off of Wilshire Boulevard in a, in a place called the Wilshire House. So Roy sent me down there to take him, take him the artwork so he can approve of it. My friend Janella, she worked in the back office with me. She used to dance with MC Hammer, you know, um, a few, uh, for, what, a year prior. She was still doing things with Hammer, but me and her became good friends because we used to share a space. So she drove me down to meet up with Pac. So when I took everything to him, I showed Pac. He approved of the album cover. He liked the artwork. And at that time, he wanted me to start painting pictures for his home because Death Row was about to give me an art show, I was about to be the first artist, visual artist off the label, and they were set enough to give me an art show. Pac was going to host it. So he was telling me that day, like, yo, I'm going to host this art show run for you. You know, once you get everything, we get everything together when we get back from Vegas. Like, 
you know, he told me that, you know, the walls were naked in his pad. He needed something on them to start painting pictures, and he was going to start putting them around. He was basically, like, giving me the go-ahead, telling me he was basically going to endorse me. But, you know, that next day he ended up getting shot, and, you know, things didn't happen the way, you know, that they were meant to happen. I do have to ask, was he in good spirits? Because there's there's a flip side of the coin. Some people say he was unhappy. Some people say that he was completely happy. In your experience, I, and I know you can't judge the man's feelings, but outwardly, was he in good spirits that day? I mean, that day he was in good spirits. He was he was excited, especially when I gave him the album artwork. He was really excited, and he was really pumped up for me to, you know, do stuff around his house. You know, a lot of people will probably think, oh, it's just his story. It's just something he want to say to make himself. I know he was really pumped up that day. He was telling me, like, yo, you got to, you got to, you know, start doing this, start doing that. Like, he was, he was in real good spirits that day. Like, it was, it was enough to have me excited to can't wait to get back from Vegas to get started. How did you hear that he had been shot? It was crazy. I worked in 662 that night, and the rumor mill had been floating around, you know, that, that everything happened, you know, that a shooting had happened. But, I mean, you know, we didn't we didn't see anything. And, I mean, everybody was speculating because they were late. But to me, that was like, yo, he was late. I mean, they was late to everything. So that really didn't make me feel like, you know, something had really happened. You know, so... It wasn't until the club was over and it had never showed up that it sparked it sparked question in my mind. But it wasn't until I got back to my hotel room and 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 jumped in the bed and turned the TV on and it was on every news channel when it happened. So that's when I actually found out what really happened when I made it back to my hotel room and, and got to the news. A lot of people said they thought he was going to pull through. Did you have high hopes for that? Yeah, I definitely thought he was going to pull through. I definitely thought that. I'm like, yo, he had been shot already five, five times before he made it. You know, everybody was praying. The whole office was praying. Everybody everybody just knew he was going to make it. I mean, for him to pass, that touched a lot of us. Like, that, that, that hurt a lot of us when he passed. This question wasn't in there, but it's it's a softball. Um, what was the atmosphere like after he passed at death row, and at what point did you decide it was time to move away and pursue other avenues? I mean, that day it was it was somber. Like, I mean, when we got the word, you know, a couple of people were crying. You know, the office was real quiet. That same day was a payday. Like, usually you have so many people waiting on their checks so they can go go cash their checks or do whatever they wanted to, but that day seemed like it just didn't matter. Like, it was just a real, very feeling. Like, as loud as the office used to be during any other time, like, you could just, you could just hear, like, Man, it's hard to it's hard to describe, man. You could fucking hear like a pin drop on the floor, like all through the whole entire office. It was like it was it was it was very it was it was it was sad. It was real sad. Um I believe the next question you asked me is when did I decide to leave? Like I didn't really just decide to just leave that bro. I was I was a death row inmate from, from my mind, I was going to be a death row inmate until I got released from death row. I was going to stick around. I was just, I was loyal to that cause. You know what I mean? And it wasn't until there was a situation where Nate dog, where I was released and I just left. I ended up leaving and I didn't look back. And at that time, Shug was in, Shug was in jail. So I didn't look back. I just kept, I just kept going with the situation. I didn't, I didn't, I just didn't stop. Did you get any, have you ever gotten any negative reactions because you did artwork at Death Row Records? 
I mean, there were a few people, like, after I left Death Row, I was, I was searching for industry jobs. I mean, when I was working at Death Row, I had everybody hitting me up, like, yo, uh, can you do this album cover for this person? Can you work with that? Can you do this? And once I left Death Row, nobody wanted to give me a gig. It was like I was blackballed. Everybody was afraid to hire me because they didn't know if Suge was going to be mad that I was working with them. They, Nobody wanted to give me a gig so far, so much to where I just I left the industry as a whole in uh, in 1998. I left it as a whole. Like I wasn't even working for industry no more. I started being an, an, an administrative assistant for executive suite. I couldn't I couldn't land another gig in the industry. Do you remember the first time that someone recognized you for your work? that you didn't know that came up to you and said, Hey, you're, you're the guy that did the Machiavelli cover. Do you, do you remember? No, because it wasn't, it wasn't a never, it was never a thing like that. It's, it goes back to the beginning of the interview. I mean, a lot of people, like if, if people were around death row, they knew who I was, but if it was on the outside of death row, people didn't know who I was. I might be standing right next to you and you would never have a clue to, I did the Machiavelli album cover. So I never had anybody step up to me and be like, yo, you the one that did that Machiavelli cover. It was only that when people came around me, like people that people, once I left that room, when people, people, I really didn't push that on people. When I met people, I didn't, I really kind of kept that to myself. You know, I didn't want people to judge me for that, but it wasn't until somebody got close enough or deep enough into my world that when they started really seeing who I was, that really shocked them. Like, yo, really did some legendary stuff. Like, what are you doing working here? Why are you here? Why, what, like, wow, what, why, what, what are you doing? It wasn't until those times, you know what I mean, that it really made me feel as if, yo, I needed to, to get back out there and do something art-wise because, I mean, after losing Pac and the whole Nate Dogg situation, I had, I had felt like art had, a, had basically got up and abandoned me for a minute. I just didn't, I just didn't have that feeling no more. May I ask what the situation was with Nate Dogg? I mean, it was basically he was leaving. I did some artwork for him he took it to another label i talked about this in my book also <laughs> he left and i end up getting the raw end of the deal speaking of your book um where where can we order the book and is it a limited release no it's not a limited release i'm selling as many books as the people people want i mean the book right now is on amazon it should be available if you want to walk in um Barnes and Nobles and order it. I mean, I sell it directly from my website and it's on sale directly at Amazon also. I mean, it's available at riskyforever.com and you know, you spell my name R-I-S-K-I-E-F-O-R-E-V-E-R.com. I mean, it's available right there, but it's, it's, it's available. I'm not, I'm not, like I said, it's not limited. It's just, I'm just moving, trying to move as many units as I can. I'm trying to get as many people to know my story as possible. And like I said, it's not a story to really talk about all of the bad things that happen. I mean, this is a story, even though I do still have some, some of my, I do have all of my own personal stories, you know, revolving around everything that I went through. But it's just not just about all of the bad stuff that happened. It's about some good things that went down as well it's in the book. I mean, it's just, it's just my story, just from my perspective, revolving around everything, from every album release and from, from, from Tupac's death on on now to the future. For the diehard fans out there, are you offering autograph copies for sale? I mean, I'm doing that also. If somebody orders it directly from my site, I mean, I'll sign it up and I'll send it directly to them. Because right now, what I have right now, I have, I started with the first edition it wasn't moving the way I wanted it to move with the publishing company that I was working with. So what I did was I shut that down and then I went back to the lab and I created a, a deluxe edition. So the deluxe edition, it'll start, it'll start, it's up actually up for sale right now on Amazon, but I'll have physical copies in, in my hands maybe this week. It's a whole entirely different cover. It's new pages added to it. A lot of, a lot of, from the first book, I didn't get to add as much stuff as I wanted to add. But once I 
I left the first publishing house, I said I couldn't just put out the same thing and let them, let them have credit. I wanted it to be entirely different. So I changed the cover up a little bit, and I added extra pages to it. So, I mean, like I said, everybody that's read the first book, the first edition, I haven't gotten any bad responses. I get people all of the time hitting me up, telling me how it's a great book. They couldn't hardly put it down. I'm just, I'm just excited for that, and I just want to just, like I said, I want to let as many people know my, know my story as, as possible, and I want it to be a motivational thing too, because, you know, there's a lot of artists out here, you know, namely me growing up in Compton. You know, we feel like, you know, we have to be stuck. You know what I mean? Where we're at, and it's like we don't really feel like we can evolve from the, from the city that we come from to be able to be one of these top-notch artists. And what I'm doing is letting everybody know that. It's possible from somebody that was out here selling drugs on the streets every day to be able to draw a record, to draw a record cover for a major artist that sold over 10 million copies. I mean, it's all possible. And I'm letting everybody know by reading my story that this is possible. You just have to be smart about the things that you're doing while you're doing it. That's perfect. You want to end it there? I mean, you can. It's dope. <laughs> I mean, it just feel like it's something you know you don't want to ask. But I mean, I'm cool with it. I I think we got it. I want. I think it's just enough for people, like especially with. This is a J Mix exclusive. What up, Shadow?